I was stepping on some engineering toes, trying to create engineering solutions. And the engineers were looking at me like, like, you're a product manager. Why are you telling us how to build it? Hi, I'm your host, Magali Pellissier, and I'm a product manager. It's the fifth episode, and I wanted to say thank you. Thank you to my guests who have taken the plunge to be in the first few episodes, but also thank you to the people who've listened. We've reached several dozens of listeners and the audience keeps on growing. If you like the podcast, please do share it around with your friends and colleagues and put a comment or rate it on your favorite podcast platform. You are key to help spread the word. This week is a bit special because it's a bonus episode. I still want to show you the other side of the product, but this time my guest is a former engineer turned product manager. It's not uncommon to have former stakeholders converting to a product role. We'll uncover what makes a good product and product manager from their perspective, based on their experience on the other side. Stakeholder management is a key skill for product managers. So just as you're obsessed with listening to your customers, let's hear from your stakeholders. My guest today is Moshe Mikanowski. He's a leader in product management who started his career on the engineering side, specifically within the enterprise real-time B2B software space. He fell in love with product management after seeing the gap that existed between what customers wanted and what engineering produced. Moshe enjoys applying his lean iterative approach to develop products that exceed users' expectations. Aside from product, He co-hosts the Product for Product podcast and recently published a novel. Thank you very much for joining me today. So you've worked for 20 years in engineering, in development, sales engineering, and customer support. How did you get into this? I actually started my career in the army in Israel. I was a software development in the army, and that opened up my career to all the engineering side. Right after I finished my service, I joined a company in Israel that then uh, relocated me to the U.S., and I was about six years in the States. And over there with them, I was still doing software development, but because I was working with the field, it was more customizations and specific tools that were extending the software that we were supporting and a lot of uh, customer support and pre-sale. And that gave me an opportunity to be on the side of the business that was not the core development, but more talking with the clients, talking with users. We were a very small team in the beginning in the States. We were like three people. One of them was the sales guy. One of them was like an administrator and me. So I was dealing with all the technical stuff. And then we grew up the team and we hired more people. Because it was such a small team, I was able to touch many different areas. Okay. So what did you learn from these experiences? How did they complement each other? Back then it was all on the engineering side, but later on in my career and recently, you know, because I'm a product manager in the last 10 years, I actually reflected on what I learned from that experience on product management, because there is a lot you can learn about product management and how to be a better product manager when you are actually working in other areas of the business. So definitely the ability to be right there with the users, see how they work, because I was going to different locations of our clients and I would see how they use our software and then what's the issues that they have in the workflow. So that gave me a very deep uh, perspective into the user problems that I was able to then send back to headquarters and tell them, this is what the users really do. This is their real problem. And then I was able to either influence the future of the product, the core product, or build these customizations that were able to extend the software to solve specific problems that they had. So it really gave me this empathy we we're always looking for with clients and the users. Was there a product manager at the time? No, no. Um, <laughs> here I'm talking about between 96 to 2002. So it's been a very long time ago. And even after that, even in 2010, a product manager was still more of a marketing person. They were not really managing the product. And then other positions that I have after that, when I moved to Canada, I was the head of development in um, a software company here in Toronto. And then I was a CTO of a startup company. And throughout this entire experience, I never had a product manager. So a lot of the work that a product manager does today, I was doing. 
Okay, yeah, very interesting. Knowing what you know now, being a product manager, if you could go back in time when you were in engineering, what would you change? Would you do something differently? Probably, yes. I would try to influence our sales cycle much more because back then we were very much sales oriented and we would even have these programs that the clients would pay us to be on this committee to tell us what they want. But at the end of the day, it was a sell thing. The salespeople were able to sell whatever they wanted and I was supporting them in the pre-sale process. I would always to say, yes, yes, we have that, no matter what the client was asking for. So I would definitely change all of that from the perspective of does really the client wants to, to, to use that or they just they think they need it, but eventually they will never use that. I, I knew it was wrong back then, but I didn't know why so much. So being in the product and in 21st century product, it's a much more uh, known thing this day that you really need to follow the product, not so much the sale. If as a product manager now, you had to talk to yourself as an engineer then, how would you explain to them exactly what you've described to me, but we shouldn't do exactly what the users are asking for and all of that product thinking? I would tell myself that I need to first find a proof that this is really what users want. And this is really going to solve the problem for the users. And to find the proof is not an easy thing. So define a hypothesis and then go and do whatever I can do to actually put things in front of the users and see, is this really solving your problem? Do it uh, in the cheapest way possible before I invest all the money in, in actually building it. The tricky part over there would be, how do I convince the salespeople and the management that this is the right thing to do? And that's um, always that uh, tension between sales and product. Even today, it depends on how the company works, if they are more sales oriented or product oriented or technology oriented. On that, that's a much harder discussion to my younger self because part of it is was I was young and it was hard for me also to say no back then. And these days it's much easier to say no. And also the tools that we had back then were were not as sophisticated as what we have today. So data driven was not as robust as what we can do today. Technology moves so fast, we lived in a different generation. I must want to say it is your job to say no <laughs> right now as a product manager. It's still a hard thing to do, but I, I can do it much better these days than I used to. What about this position in customer support? Do you think that engineers who work in development would benefit from having that kind of exposure? Absolutely. Yeah. Either for the engineering or for the product person or even for designers, anyone working on the product team would benefit in, in working sometime in customer support because you really build your empathy muscle. You know that your goal in customer support is to help the client. Sometimes uh, there is this line between how much do I go to help the client but still support my organization? And you have to be creative with that. You have to be creative sometimes with the way to explain things or convince people about why things are needed. So you really build a lot of muscles in there of empathy, creativity, opportunity seeking and problem solving. And of course, you know, talking with people. Sometimes developers are very much just they're comfortable talking with a computer, but not so much with other people. And these days, it's very hard to work on your own, uh, no matter what position you're, you're at. You are working on a team. You can't achieve everything on your own. There is a lot to be done that need other people's help. And finally, I have a proof for that because I did see a lot of people that are have gone through product support or customer support and they became a much better, you know, whatever they are. So people that moved from customer support to be amazing product managers, engineers that understood much better their clients and therefore were able to create better solutions for the clients. So overall, it's definitely a win-win for everyone. You don't want to fail for the sake of failing. You want to fail for the sake of learning and getting it better the next time that you're doing it. Part of your experience is also as a CTO. So what were your responsibilities in that role? I was a CTO of a startup in Toronto. I was hired as the second developer and then uh, the, the first guy left and then we I built the entire IT department over there. We were building um, debit card solutions for non-financial institutions. Back then, again, I didn't have a product manager working with me, so I was also the product manager. Startup is a very dynamic environment. You have to build things fast to pivot sometimes, so we had to pivot a few times. 
you learn, uh, you fail and you, you come back on your feet. Uh, we learn the hard way about security issues. We learn about uh, different uh, compliance issues and stuff like that. And I was also responsible for the team, but also responsible for the business, working with the CEO, the COO, the marketing, the, the uh, salespeople. And many times standing in front of some investors or potential investors to explain our technology and, of course, with clients. You've talked about learning the hard way about challenges. What do you think of this career? of failure and learning. Is it really working? Do engineers really are ready to admit when things go wrong? Are product people so ready to admit that? Or is it still something that people don't really talk about? I think these days it's much better than in the past because I think many more people realize that failure is not necessarily a bad thing. There is definitely these thoughts from managers that you have to do it the right way the first time. But we see with the complex systems that we're building, it's almost impossible to not fail at all. We learn all the time about what works, what not. Our market can change. We sometimes have to pivot. People have to really adopt this mindset that failure is not a bad thing. You don't want to fail for the sake of failing. You want to fail for the sake of learning and getting it better the next time that you're doing it. And if you didn't learn anything from the failure, then that's a failure as well. It's still the positive way to fail, I guess. As a CTO, how did you know you were successful? What kind of metrics did you use to monitor this? The main KPIs that I had or main objectives that I had were transactional and clients. So we had different non-financial institutions clients that we needed to support. And then we needed to increase the number of transactions, so different opportunities to build for the users on transacting through those uh, debit cards. And all of that information was available to me through the system, so that wasn't a big deal. But we still needed also to make sure that the system will perform properly because we were supporting users all over the world. We had to have fail safes for what if the system goes down, how do the system still continue working? So very high SLA levels. So I had to put different systems in place as backups, both technically, but also even vendors. So we didn't rely only on one vendor. So you transitioned from engineering to product. Do you think any engineer can become a product manager? A lot of it is, is a personality and really what you like to focus your career on. I've noticed that a lot of product managers are very outgoing and open and, and they like to talk and to be out there. It doesn't mean that an introvert cannot be a product manager. I'm sure that there are many that could, but this is just my very limited personal view on this, that you really need to be an outgoing because you have to talk with everyone, create that empathy to everyone. And not just your users, but also your stakeholders. And so I think this is more about that rather than about, you know, being an engineer or not being an engineer. As an engineer, I was lucky that I was able to be in front of users and, and actually experience that throughout my career. That's one of the things where in, in a startup or in a small organization give you that opportunity for sure. So because I had all of that experience doing it on top of being a developer, it was easy transition for me because I knew what it takes, you know, to be in front of people and to do discovery and to see how people work and then identify problems that they have and try to come up with solutions for them. This is about the advantages of transitioning from engineering to product. Do you think there are some drawbacks as well? Probably the first thing that I had when I transitioned into product management, I was stepping on some engineering toes, trying to create solutions, engineering solutions like, oh, let's build this database this way and let's structure it that way. And the engineers will look at me and lie like, you're a product manager. Why are you telling us how to build it? And I kind of learned quickly that I have other things to deal with that I have to rely on the developers to do that, of course. But otherwise, um, but on the other end, you know, the time that passed by, also they move very fast and they change very fast. Because I'm not familiar with the current stacks, it, it, it limits uh, some of my knowledge on engineering. But again, it's not a big deal because I'm doing product management right now. So. There are some developers who really work in a way that they may want like the requirements and don't really have the product mindset, user focus. So having been a developer before, how can you help those engineers being more in the product mindset? 
I, I would also mention the word agility here. I believe that this is a really big part of that. One of the things that happens these days that I've noticed in many places is that when people think agility, they think about the delivery only. But the only reason to be agile is for the product. That's the way I see it, at least. So I try to pull the developers into the discussions as early as possible through the discovery process as well, so they can understand that we're not just building things because we need to get a paycheck at the end of the day. We're building things to solve real problems. And even before that, we need to identify what are the real problems so we don't build something for a perceived problem. So I, I feel that this makes the, the developers a much better agile practitioners because these ways they can identify when they get requirements or they get a story with the acceptance criteria. They can say, you know what, when we talked about it back then or whatever, this didn't seem like the highest priority thing to do or it didn't seem like is the right thing to do or whatever it is. So they are able to actually identify things that the product manager, me or the or whoever didn't identify, uh, not because I'm not good at my job, but because there is a, always things that we miss. And then as a team, we can actually put together a much better solution. In this podcast, we also have somebody, you know, asking you a question. So I'm going to play that question. Hello. My name is Michel Mitri. I'm a BI product manager and would like to ask Moshe a couple of questions, please. The first question is, how do you stay user focused? The second question is, what do you see a product manager's main role within a product development? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Michel, for the questions. User focused is definitely um, something uh, that we really need to practice all the time. I I'm trying to picture to myself who are the users and you know define those user personas but I actually don't really like those uh, marketing user persona with a fake person and they like this and they like that I never found this useful to me it's more about the um, user type or what the user is uh, trying to do then I'm trying to also identify their jobs to be done so what is their job they're trying to do and how they're doing it today and I will always try to look for people uh, that will fit these roles and then have them in my group of people to go to. So if I have three different types of users for my product, then I will try to have real people that are associated with this type. I will open communication with them and I will tell them upfront, listen, I need your help with this. You are that type of user. I will have questions once in a while and I will want you to, to help me. And usually they're very open about that and willing to do that. But it's definitely a work in progress all the time. You have to remember to do that. So this is something that you build uh, as you go as, as a master. And the second question is, what do you see is your main role as a product manager in the development cycle? I'm a big follower of uh, Marty Kagan, you know, who wrote Inspired and Empowered. And he defined it very clearly that the product manager is responsible for the value that you are creating for the users and viability to the business. And then we work together with the designers on the usability and with the developers on feasibility. I'm always trying to focus on these two things. They will sometimes include also ideas for solutions. So if I will have an idea, let's try this, let's try that, etc. I'm not saying that uh, only other people are responsible for that. So everyone is responsible for that. But I will still try to focus on does this create a value to the user and is it viable to the organization? So you're passionate about product and you've created your own podcast, Product for Product. Can you tell me more about that podcast? So I co-hosted it with uh, Matt Green and we started it uh, a year ago. What we focus on is the product stack of product people. So what are the tools, what are the products that we're using to do our job? No one really is talking about that. So all the other podcasts out there is about the discipline of product management and, and interviewing product managers, etc. And uh, when Matt approached me with that, he moved from BI into product management. So he uh, uh, wanted to learn about all of these products out there. We have this series of themed episodes where we talk about a specific area of products. So for example, product analytics, road mapping, A-B testing. And then we usually do the first episode in the series is we talk about it, what we know about it and what we're expecting to learn. Then every episode is about a different product because we don't know all of these products and we don't have the capacity to go and uh, learn all of them and be very good about it. 
we usually have a guest for each one of these products, and the guest is a user of this product. We try not to interview the company behind it, so it's not going to be a marketing spiel or bias towards that product. And then these users will tell us about the product, what they like about it, what they don't like about it. And then the last episode in the series, we usually it's basically review what we learned. Then we have also other episodes, like one-off episodes with different product people or people related somehow to product with some unique uh, perspective about product and the tools they're using for that. So if you were just developing APIs, what might be your stack? Or if you are in an agency, recently we had an episode with other podcasters that are also product managers, and we talked about tools we're using for podcasting. A bit off our main topic, but building a podcast is also like building a product. We are trying, we're failing, we're trying new things, and then we have the tools we need to use for that. So it's, it was also very interesting. So what do you think are the best tools for collaborating between engineering and product? I don't know if there is like the best tools because I'm familiar with Jira and with Azure DevOps, but I've heard about other tools that might be even better than those for your backlog. It's funny because Jira is like everyone is using Jira or everyone knows Jira, but everyone likes to complain about Jira as well. I'm using also Miro because I think it's a great tool for whiteboard and, and just free collaboration with a lot of templates and a lot of different things. We are doing these discovery sessions on a regular basis that I always include designer and the developer and, and we usually use Miro for that. We also, of course, uh, use a design system. So we use Figma and over there it's more owned by the designers, but I like the collaboration options over there. And actually, Actually, we recently started using also Stack Overflow. So we have our own team in there and we put all the questions and answers that we have over there. So if someone is looking for something, they can find it over there. I love your comment about Jira, but everybody has to use it. And it's a great <laughs> tool, but everybody complains about it. In my new job, I'm using ClickUp, which is a bit like Monday.com, Asana, and it's fantastic. Yeah, I've heard good things about it, so it's good to hear. Right. On top of a podcast, you also published a fiction book recently. So what are the parallels between writing a book and developing a product? I wrote this book for many years. And in the past, I used to paint and do some other creative stuff. And back then, I always took it as something that is a very personal thing, that it has to come from me. It's labor of love. It's my way of seeing things. I want to like it. I don't want other people to like it just because they like it and then they will buy it. That's how I saw the book as well many years ago. But then when I came to publish it recently, I decided to make a switch based on everything I learned from product. And I was like, I need to find the people that will like to read it. I need to find who they are, where they are, the same way as when you build a product. And then I need to approach them and make the book fit in that group of people. And then also I was thinking about how do I do that while getting feedback, while trying to be agile about it. There is a known thing in writing books about beta readers. Uh, they give you feedback and then you improve the book. So I did that, but I learned also from that process, what's the right number of people? Do you listen to all of them? Do you say no to some of them? Do you accept all of their comments? And then also how do I market the book? because that's a very important part of publishing a book that usually people don't like to talk about, but it's more than the writing itself, actually. And I had to pre-sell the book in order to publish it. After I went through that process, I felt that my empathy towards salespeople and towards marketing people has become much better because now I had to do it myself. So there is a lot of parallels in there. You have to develop your empathy to the developers as well. They have their own way of thinking. There is a lot of complexity in what they're doing. I have several options for you and you pick one of them. When you were in engineering, you worked in development, sales engineering and customer support. Which one do you prefer? Development. <laughs> It was still the most creative one. Sales support and customer support, although very important, I still do prefer the, uh, the development itself, you know, to build something. In your experience, you also worked in B2B, B2C, and B2B2C. Which one is your favorite? Probably B2B is the easier one for me just because of all the experience that I had with it. Although, you know, if I had to do my career again, maybe I will have gone in a different direction. So who knows? Code or no code? I would say code. But I'm actually doing right now a no-code series for the podcast, and I'm learning a lot about that. The only reason I'm saying code is because, well, I can't go against my background, 
But also, I think that to scale and to build a real product, I think you need to go with code. But there is a great space for the no-code there to build up your MVP, to build up your proof of concept. So as a product manager, maybe it's no code, but as a developer, it's probably the code. Overall, for the business viability, it's probably the code. And finally, book or podcast? Book. I definitely love to read books. I love doing both. I listen to some podcasts only because I've been involved in that. I've been, you know, guest on podcasts. I'm doing my own podcast. So it's a bit uh, weird if I won't listen to any podcast at all. But definitely my first thing to go to will be a book and a printed one, not even an e-book. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's been a very interesting discussion. What is your final piece of advice for product managers who want to work with engineers? You have to develop your empathy to the developers as well. They have their own way of thinking. There is a lot of complexity in what they're doing, the different stacks they have to learn and use. How do they test things and how do they make things scalable? There is a lot of things going on in there. I also wrote an article um, for user pilot for their blog, but I also have it on my blog. I think it was five technical skills for product managers to learn, like SQL, for example, so you can query for data if you want to, or things like that. It's a few things that could definitely help and will get you even deeper understanding of what developers has to go through. Thank you. I will include the link to this blog post in the description. If people want to reach out to you, what is the best way for them to contact you? I'm active on LinkedIn. I also have my website, mikonovsky.com. I'm open to talk with uh, anyone. Thank you very much for your time and the discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Magali. Lots of great questions. I love being here. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that it has enabled you to understand your stakeholder and inspired you to better work with them to make successful products. If so, please share the link with your friends and colleagues. And if you want to suggest some topics, some guests, if you have questions you'd like me to ask during the interviews, or if you have any feedback, you can write to me at magalipelissier at hotmail.fr.